Yeah, hi, you know, uh, Dr. Jones, if you want to show a clinical benefit, you've got to show an improvement in cough flows because increasing the uh, M maximum inspiratory or expiratory pressures at the mouth by five to seven centimeters of water is completely useless if it doesn't make the cough effective. People develop respiratory failure because of ineffective cough flows. Uh, so I'm just, just a little uh, tip there. Uh, great, great. Yeah, so, so. Interrupt this, uh, this we'll have questions uh, discussion later, but because we have this, this that's discussion great. at the end. That's yeah? great. Okay. 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 I, I um, understand your, <laughs> your reaction. Okay, is that moving? It's not moving. Yeah, so uh, let me tell everybody that um, uh, children with uh, infantile um, Pompe's disease, it's not working. It's not working right now. Okay, there we go, I guess. <clears throat> you know, you can look at neuromuscular disease, including Pompe disease, in four categories. Whether it's spinal muscular atrophy, a congenital myopathy, or Pompe's disease. Um, type 1 disease, basically, the children don't roll, they don't sit, and they have great risk of developing respiratory failure um, and, and pneumonias and so on. Type 2, kids that can sit will develop respiratory failure when they get a respiratory tract infection because their cough flows are ineffective. Um, type 3 uh, are like uh, children that can walk, uh, temporarily at least. Usually they're spared the first couple of years because their cough flows uh, are somewhat effective. But there are exceptions to that. Adolescent onset, likewise. When the cough flows for an adolescent or an adult goes below 300 liters a minute or 270 liters a minute, the patients have an increased risk of pneumonia and respiratory failure during respiratory tract infections. This is a patient with uh, Pompe disease. He was a high school football player. He was in the Marines, did fine in the Marines, got out of the Marines, went to work, and he started developing respiratory orthopnea, which is very common in Pompe's disease. Patients' vital capacities can go down more than 50% when they lie down as opposed to when they're sitting, and patients can need nighttime ventilatory support. Not BiPAP, not polysomnograms, not pulmonary function testing, which is virtually useless for Pompe's disease. Why? Because pulmonary function testing, when they send you to the PFT's lab, is designed to evaluate lung and airways diseases, not muscles, okay? Polysomnograms evaluate and cause uh, attribute every apnea and hypopnea to central or obstructive in nature and not respiratory muscle weakness, okay? So uh, these techniques are basically useless for neuromuscular disease, including Pompe's disease. Now this is a child with um, a severe Pompe's, infantile Pompe's disease. None of these children should uh, die from respiratory complications or ever get a tracheostomy tube. Now I have none of these children, but I have 100 children with spinal muscular atrophy type 1. The children with type 1, severe type 1, normally die before six months of age because they stop breathing during sleep, okay? If they are diagnosed, they get trach tubes, and then 80% of them die because of the tube, not because of the disease. They, their lungs do not grow. Uh, they develop funnel-shaped chests, pectus excavatums, and they stop breathing. Uh, these two brothers, uh, in 1996, I told the parents of the older boy here that he'd be dead within one year if he didn't get a tracheostomy tube because he has no bulbar innervated muscles. He's got no throat muscles. So like every other doctor, I thought he wouldn't be able to protect his airways. So mom got pregnant and had another child with SMA type 1, 24-hour vent dependent since four months of age, both of these boys. By that time, though, I did, wasn't so sure they were going to die uh, because uh, they didn't have trach tubes. Well, here they are in 2010, and this is about uh, last month. They're now 24 and 23 years old. They've had zero vital capacity since they were infants. They've been 24-hour event dependent since they were four months old, and they do not have any tracheostomy tubes. In fact, I now have nine of these children over 20 years of age with no muscle movement at all, no bulbar innervated muscles, no skeletal muscles, absolutely nothing since they were infants. They've never been able to make a consonant sound, never been able to make a vowel sound. They cannot move a finger, even trace. They cannot move their tongue a millimeter and they cannot grimace, but they don't have trach tubes, and they're 25 years old now. I've got nine of them. In fact, I've got uh, over 80 of them on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support with no trach tube. If they don't need a trach tube, nobody with Pompe's disease needs a trach tube. Now, Pompe's disease is very different. Heart disease does not kill these kids with SMA, but unfortunately, uh, it does in, in Pompe's disease. This is another child with typical SMA type 1. I told his parents he'd be dead within one year too. And now he's 25 years old with SMA type 1. Uh, it's not just SMA type 1. I have two patients with Duchenne over 50 years of age. They're supposed to live 18 years, not 50 years. 
Anyone with a trach tube, 80% will die because of the trach tube. These patients don't die. In fact, they don't even get hospitalized. My 50-year-olds with Duchenne muscular dystrophy have never even been to the hospital. They've never developed respiratory failure. They've never been intubated. They've never even been hospitalized for anything. And half of my patients, that's the case. This is a woman who's been on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support for 65 years, since 1954. I have multiple patients in this category. They had polio. They came out of iron lungs. And 20, 65 years of continuous non And this woman works full-time for the last 40 years as a rehabilitation counselor, even though she has no movement below her neck. But her head works really well, and she can talk. And obviously, she can eat. So um, she does perfectly OK supporting herself. Now, there are people who can walk, like these guys. Uh, they also uh, uh, do not need tracheostomy tubes. So how do we do this? PFTs are worthless because they don't measure cough flows. They don't measure carbon dioxide. They don't measure spirometry in the supine condition. They're, 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 everything they measure is useless for people with muscle weakness. We measure carbon dioxide. This is end tidal carbon dioxide. Totally painless, pick it up at the nose, and uh, you know what the CO2 is. Oxygen saturation, a $15 peak flow meter to measure cough flows, uh, because that is where the money is, okay? Patients go into respiratory failure because they can't cough, and it's because they can't cough they can't breathe, okay? Um, and um, that's why if you're gonna do a clinical benefit with anything, you've gotta show an improvement in cough flows, and of course, a spirometer. Now, spirometry is important not just for the vital capacity in the sitting position, but also lying down. If you're wearing a brace or you're not wearing a brace, in different positions, with a binder, and so on, whatever. But you've got to do spirometry on the patients, um, it, and also for active and passive lung volume recruitment, which I hope to have time to get into. And by the way, Priya, Priya, I want to tell you that you said you made a statement this morning that uh, the kids were too weak to, to cooperate with PFTs. Nobody is too weak to cooperate with PFTs. There was a doctor in 1960s, I forget his name, he, he described the cry vital capacity. When these kids cry, uh, or when they breathe, they're putting 80 to 90% of their inspiratory capacity in their efforts. And, and the magic number is 50 milliliters. When, when I have a patient transferred to me for extubation because the parents don't want the kid to get trached, I, 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 I look at the volume that that patient is exhaling into the ventilator, when it's 50 milliliters or more, I tell the mom that after we extubate this child, that child will wean. If it's much less than 50, I say, well, usually after we extubate, the vital capacity goes up and the child will wean. Anyway, if you don't trach the kid, they will wean back to what they were using before they got intubated in the first place. When you trach them, they will never breathe again, whether that's Pompe's disease, congenital myopathies, or SMA type 1. Uh, so, oh, the cryovital capacity, I just mentioned that. Okay, so three aspects to care, long-term management, Extubation of unweanable patients, back to non-invasive ventilatory support, and the cough assist, which is mechanical insufflation, exufflation, and decannulation of patients who never should have gotten trached in the first place. Now, I doubt that I'll have the time to talk about extubation and decannulation of patients. Anybody with Pompe's disease who has a tracheostomy tube never should have gotten it in the first place can come to us and we can show you how to get rid of it. Anybody who's intubated for a pneumonia and seven doctors are telling them to get trached, I recommend you refuse, force the doctors to call me, you get transferred to us, I guarantee you you will be extubated without ever getting a tracheostomy tube. Nobody with Pompe's disease, even infantile Pompe's disease, should ever really be trached. It's really not necessary. The pediatric intensivists simply have to learn how to do things the way we do, which of course they don't want to do. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, doctors take care of people with um, a failure of ventilation and failure of oxygenation. But really, doctors are used to people with COPD, asthma, and so on. That's failure of oxygenation. Um, and they treat everybody as though they have a failure of oxygen. So in other words, they will put you on bronchodilators. They will put you on oxygen. And all that's going to do is cause your CO2 to go through the roof, and eventually you'll become obtunded and maybe even comatose from CO2 retention. Most common errors, misinterpretation of symptoms. Patients in wheelchairs usually do not complain if they're short of breath before they arrest. What they often complain of is anxiety and inability to sleep. The reason they're anxious and can't sleep is because when we sleep, we don't recruit our accessory breathing muscles and our cough and our drive to breathe are depressed or suppressed. But the patients don't tell you that. But that's what's going on. That's why they can't sleep. PFTs are worthless. Um, polysomnographies are worthless. Um, the if you have a question, if your patient is symptomatic with a decreased vital capacity, they deserve a trial of nighttime nasal ventilatory support. 
If they feel better using it, let them use it. And if they don't, don't worry about it. Have them come back next year or next month or whatever. Nobody dies because they're not put on non-invasive ventilatory support too soon. Uh, they die because they get colds and they can't cough and they go into respiratory failure. They give an oxygen instead of ventilatory support in the cough assist and they arrest. That's why they die. Tracheostomy tubes are completely unnecessary for any neuromuscular disease except the patients with upper motor neuron disease, which basically is amyotrophic a lateral sclerosis. Suctioning 90% of the time doesn't get the left main stem bronchus, the catheter goes into the right, which is why 84% of pneumonias are in the left lung. Instead of suctioning, use the cough assist. Use it through invasive interfaces, use it through non-invasive interfaces, and use it at proper settings, not the nonsense of 20, 30 centimeters of water pressure. Through a translaryngeal tube, you've got to use it at 60 to 70 centimeters of water pressure, and through a mask covering the nose and mouth, you've got to use it at 40 to 60 centimeters of water pressure, generally 50 to 60. Anybody sending you home on oxygen is going to hasten you to return to the hospital sooner than if they don't treat you with anything at all. Oxygen not only causes more pneumonias and problems, um, it uh, makes the oximeter useless as a gauge of what? The oximeter, if the saturation is less than 95, it's got to be one of three things. The CO2 is high, the airways, or, you, or you have airway secretions you're not clearing. And if you don't clear those secretions and your baseline stays less than 95, you will get pneumonia. The oxygen doesn't treat the problem. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a cancer. It makes it worse. In fact, anyone going home with neuromuscular disease on oxygen will go into respiratory failure sooner than you do if you do nothing whatsoever for them. I published that in 1995. And it's uh, on 750 patients. <sighs> so uh, that's oximetry. Uh, the PFTs are worthless for neuromuscular disease. Tracheotomies, this is a foreign body in your throat. It's pathogenically colonized with pathogenic bacteria. There's no blood supply to these bacteria, so you can't get rid of them with antibiotics. Anybody with a trach tube has as much pathogenic bacteria in their lungs as anybody with acute pneumonia. That's a fact. It's been published many times. 17 to 65 percent of patients develop tracheal stenosis. When that happens, I can't remove the tube anymore. And anybody on trach ventilation gets hyperventilated. They get hyperventilated because they don't feel like they're getting enough air, so they keep asking for more air. Why don't they feel like they're getting enough air? Because you're bypassing upper airway afferents, because the tube is causing chronic inflammation, airway secretions that block respiratory exchange membrane. There are many reasons why. Uh, I refer you to my books and my articles about that. But when we take the trach tubes out of people who are hyperventilated, their CO2 comes up to normal when they use non-invasive ventilatory support. Notice, I'm not saying non-invasive ventilation. Non-invasive ventilation has come to mean CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, which is a pneumatic splint to keep the airways open so that you can use your muscles to breathe, and therefore it's completely useless for Pompe's disease or bi-level positive airway pressure, which is not entirely useless, but it's always used at less than ventilatory support settings. Therefore, it doesn't rest your muscles op optimally, and it doesn't provide respiratory support. And since these doctors who prescribe the BiPAP and CPAP don't understand non-invasive ventilatory support, they also don't understand how to use um, um, cough assists and mechanical insufflation and exufflation. Therefore, they think that Patients whose non-invasive ventilation fails, they need trach tubes. It's not the non-invasive ventilation that's failing. It's the clinicians who don't understand how to administer non-invasive ventilatory support and how to use the cough assist properly. Um, uh, invasive ventilation, let me see. How much more time do I have here? Ooh, oh, I have six more minutes, I think. OK, OK. Oh, yeah, 80% of patients on trach ventilation die because of the tube. That includes ALS patients, that includes Duchenne patients, 60% for spinal cord injured patients. I'd love to give you the number. Um, it's 50% at least for SMA. Uh, I can't give you the number of Pompe's disease because I've only got 14 Pompe's patients. All of them are adults, and um, you know they're doing okay. They're all on replacement therapy. Um, <clears throat> so now, there's inspiratory, expiratory muscles, and bulbar innervated muscles. If your vital capacity is zero, you have no inspiratory and you have no coughing muscles at all. Not, not a big problem. You can use non-invasive ventilatory support, a pneumo belt, a mouthpiece. You can use the cough assist for your expiratory muscles. My patients can go 65 years like this. Duchenne patients, 30 years, okay? Pompeii patients, also. So um, that's not a big problem. But the bulbar muscles are a problem, okay? We cannot replace them. However, my kids with SMA type 1, their mothers position them so they drool. They do not aspirate. 
and they don't get pneumonias. Those two brothers I showed you have been each hospitalized once in their lives. One at eight years of age and one at 12 years of age for pneumonia. Uh, we intubated them for seven to 10 days and after we used the cough assist to clear their secretions and got them healthy again, we extubated them back to 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support and sent them home. None of these patients, we have now extubated 81 consecutive unweanable Duchenne patients without a single one ever getting a trach tube. I tell the parents of kids with Pompeii and Duchenne and SMA, you will never need a tracheostomy tube. I don't care if 10 doctors tell you that you'll die without one, just refuse. The doctors have to call me. The patients get transferred to us from all over the planet. And we extubate every single one of them without sticking a tube in their throats. Now, when the vital capacity goes down, the, CO, the uh, cough flows go down too, and they become ineffective. That's because the average tidal volume for an adult is 600 milliliters, but the average cough volume is four times that. Nobody empties their lungs to cough. You take a deep breath to cough, two and a half liters to cough. So even if your abdominal muscles are strong, your cough flows are not going to be so good if you don't get a deep breath. So the goals are to optimize uh, pulmonary compliance, increase cough flows, and maintain normal ventilation around the clock. How do we maintain compliance? By active and passive lung volume recruitment. If your vital capacity is 20%, that means you're not expanding 80% of your lungs. I don't care how deep you try to breathe, you cannot expand that 80% of your lungs. You need an ambu bag to air stack. Get the breath, hold it, take another breath, and so on. And if you can't do that, you need to do it passively by using an ambu bag with the exhalation valve block so that you get pumped up. Everybody needs to be pumped up once in a while, especially if your vital capacity is less than normal, okay? So you get, oh, how about this here? You think I'm wearing this to be fashionable? Um, this is what I, how I teach frog breathing. Um, if I get hit by a truck and become a C1 quad, nobody's going to need to intubate me because I can ventilate my lungs all day long by You can all do it too. And don't tell me you can't do it because I taught a bird how to do it. I taught a parrot how to do this and I've got a video to prove it. And after I taught that parrot, he and I are like this, okay? And it's true, I'm not joking, you need the brain of a bird to frog breathe, so I don't wanna hear. You, we were doing it before we were born. Now when you can frog breathe, I have patients whose ventilators fail during their sleep. Patients with zero vital capacity. They woke up frog breathing to say, oh, my, my respirator's not working. You think you can do that with a trach tube? Believe me, you cannot, okay? The reason, frog breathing alone is the most important reason to remove the tracheostomy tubes of patients who should have never gotten them. So uh, when you air stack, either by an ambu bag, a ventilator, or by frog breathing, you blow it into the spirometer. If the lips are weak, you can use a lip seal. And uh, you know we get large volumes that way. Now, this is one of those two little brothers with SMA type one. Um, oh, uh, the reason I put him here is to show that these kids cannot air stack, obviously, okay? But, we, um, but the nighttime ventilatory support settings that we use, which are pressures of more than 20 centimeters of water, expand their lungs and help maintain their elasticity. I can now get almost two liters of air in these young men's lungs. Again, they're 24 and 23 years old right now. Cough flows are extremely important because a mucus plug can cause the lung to collapse immediately. 90% of death and, and hospitalizations are due to episodes of, of colds in children with neuromuscular disease. To cough, you need to take a deep breath, create thoracoabdominal pressure, open that glottis, and you get an explosive decompression. You blow that air into the, uh, the peak flow meter, we measure that, and then we teach you how to do assisted coughing, manually assisted coughing, which you may know of as quad coughing or whatever else. But the fact of the matter is that this kind of thing um, use your head if necessary, you know, this kind of thing greatly increases cough flows and makes them functional. The only problem with it is it's kind of energy intensive and you have to have someone around all day when you're sick to do this like every 10 or 15 minutes. The cough assist is very useful because when you use it, you create the great cough flows that work and clear both airways. Um, but you've got to use it at 50 to 60 centimeters of water pressure through non-invasive interfaces and 60 to 70 through invasive airway tubes as I met, mentioned. Uh -huh. All right, so as I figured, I'm not gonna have time to talk to you about extubation. This fellow over here would never have needed a ventilator if um, he allowed us to take his trach out, but he, um, but he knew he would raise enough money to get cured in one year, at least that's what he told me. Um, but um, he traveled everywhere with his cough assist because he recognized that it was more comfortable and effective to use the cough assist through the trach tube than, than to be suctioned.
the suction catheter just does not make it into the left main stem bronchus. Uh, ventilation, I've already pretty much told you about ventilation. There's lots of symptoms and so on, and the ventilators like a pickup truck and you use, look, we don't use BiPAP. The EPAP is completely counterproductive. Um, the reason that people use EPAP is because the sleep doctors make a lot of money doing polysomnograms and they treat old men who snore, so they just treat everybody like an old man who snores. The fact of the matter is none of us need to have our exhalation stopped by air coming at us, stopping us from exhaling. It makes no sense whatsoever for people with healthy lungs and airways to get EPAP or PEEP. COPD? Yeah. Trach tubes with no subglottic pressure? Maybe. But certainly not anybody else. But I, like I said, polysomnograms are not even programmed to interpret the problem appropriately. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, this is how we ventilate the babies, and everybody's got a different kind of nose. I just want to show you a website. That's all. Um, let me see here. I did have one or two extra images for you all. Gee, where the, okay, yeah, so these are websites, the breathemvs.com website. I really recommend if you know anybody with neuromuscular disease of any type, especially Pompe's disease, which is a myopathy, they will never need a tracheostomy tube. CO2 needs to be normalized, and if anybody's using oxygen, you really should come to see us in New Jersey. Uh, I'll have to stop there. Okay.